and you're kind of saying, well, well, no, I'm still Jewish, you know, and Jesus was Jewish and Mary was Jewish and, and, and they don't see it that way. Um, and it's hard because you're trying to explain to your children why people aren't talking to you anymore. Um, and that was very painful or why kids can't play with you anymore because we were kind of almost like a, a pariah because during that interim time, my husband also accepted Christ uh, a <laughs> wow, couple of months wow, later, wow. Um, which was huge because he was, he was an Israeli atheist, so, um, you know, non-practicing Jew. And he came to Christ, you know, just like I said, a couple of months later, and we were living this Christian wow. life, talking about Jesus, really evangelizing um, to our friends and our and our family, and nobody could understand. They thought we were both completely nuts. So that was that was difficult. Wow. That was difficult. Non-denominational at this point. Yes, we were still non-denominational. Very very involved in our church. Yeah. Loved our church. We had gone to several. Um, at that time, I didn't understand as a Jewish person what the difference was between being a Protestant and a Catholic. I'm like, oh, I'm at church. They're all the same. This is great. Um, and so it really wasn't until um, I started blogging. I'm an attorney, but I started to, I'm a, I also write, I freelance. And I started blogging and started realizing, oh, there's all these other denominations out here. And wow, this is kind of strange. They don't believe maybe what I believe. And I kind of started seeing a lot of um, spats and uh, you know theology discussions. And it, it was bothersome because I'm thinking, well, we're unified in the body of Christ and, and we're all following Jesus. And, and, and it wasn't so that way. So blogging really kind of opened up my eyes to, I guess, the larger Christian world and some of the issues we face um, with all the various people and denominations. And that's when... I started to ask a lot of questions in my mind about what really is non-denominational um, and some of those more difficult questions. Okay. Um, during that time, too, I started to miss my traditions. I started to, because we were still celebrating the Jewish holidays, and we still do, um, although we incorporate Christ into them, so it's a little bit different. But um, I said to my husband, I'm like, there's this stage. It's not really an altar, and there's a pastor there, but there's nothing there. Um, there's no candles, and there's no reverence, and there's no, and, and it just, the, the questions were just endless. But I think the to top it off, for me was problematic was I really felt this very strong urge from the Holy Spirit to pray in, in a chapel setting. And um, so I asked around and, and somebody, I think it was maybe one of our pastors, said, oh, we have, oh no, my husband actually told me, he's like, did you know that we have a chapel here? Because it was a huge campus. And I said, oh, that's great. And I went into the chapel and I, and I tried to pray and I sat there and I didn't feel anything. And again, it was like this blank slate. It was some pews, and, and it was a very simple cross, and people were kind of coming in and out. It wasn't very reverent, um, and that's kind of where my story kind of guided towards Catholicism. I started to call pretty much any non-denominational church or non-Catholic church, I guess you could say, in that greater area, and asking them what their hours were so I could come pray. And every response I got was, our church is closed during the day. Um, and then I remember thinking, I remember that during temple. I couldn't walk into temple during the day and pray. And so I started talking a lot about this on my blog, a lot. It was, it was almost to the point of obsession. And I would sit and say to myself, there's, there's got to be a, wait, there's got, we're Christians, there's got to be a place that we can pray in reverence to, to the Lord. Um, and, and a friend of mine, another blogging friend of mine out in Georgia, who was raised Anglican, she said, you have to read these three books about this, this saint. She was Jewish, and she's a convert to the Catholic faith. Her name is Edith Stein, oh, wow. and she's amazing. And, and, you know, it never really crossed my mind that she was Catholic. There was a lot of, um, in the non-denominational movement in general, a lot of anti-Catholic rhetoric, right. which I didn't enjoy that either. Um, so for me, it's always been about what does God want? What is God's will for me? I never looked at denomination, and that was just a very natural next step was to take these books and to read these books, and that began my journey home. All right. Um, and what a person to... Yes. Focus on for your yes. So I, I got I had three books and I started to read about her and, and I opened the first page and it said Edith Stein was born on October twelfth and I dropped the book because that's the day I was born. <laughs> um, page two 
Edith Stein's family was described, and it said Edel Stein, Edith Stein's grandmother's name was Adelheid. Well, my grandmother's name is Adelaide, so it was the German version of Adelaide, Adelaide being a very, uh, I mean, uncommon name. And I put the book down, and I started to cry. Um, and I said, what are the chances of this? Um, you know, just that connection with my grandmother at the same day I was born. Um, and as I read, I almost felt like she was there because our lives were so parallel. She was, she was a philosopher. She was into psychology. She was, um, you know, brilliant. She was, you know, into schooling and education, and education had been my life. Um, and just her story was just so similar. And, and then there it was in the middle of the book, the Eucharist. And I said to myself, well, what is, what is the Eucharist? I've, I've never heard of this before. I didn't know anybody that was Catholic. Um, so I started to read about the Eucharist, and, and it started to bring up all of these emotions in me um, because that was one other thing that really bothered me um, non in my non-denominational church was taking communion. Um, we took communion, I think, once every couple of weeks, and I found it to be more in my mind of like a new age meditation more so than it was something holy um and it didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time but i also uh, at that point was still trying to figure out theology wise where i was and i was really reading so when she started talking about taking the eucharist i said to myself that's brilliant that's 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 amazing and so i said to my husband i gotta get a box of matzah and a bottle of manischewitz wine he said for what and i said i gotta start taking communion every day that's what edith did um and so i go in my little closet and i have my little manischewitz cup and my little matzah and i laugh now of course um but i started telling you know my my non-denominational friends i said you know we, we have to start taking communion and this is so important and there's got to be a reason for this never thinking in a million years oh Oh, you know, God's going to make me a Catholic, please. He already, you know, he already brought me to this non-denominational church and, you know, half the people don't talk to me, so, or at least my old friends. So I did, but as I took it every day, I said, something's not right. You know, something doesn't feel quite right. And as I made my way through the books, it was really the last book I read by um, Diane Trafflett, who's a dean at Seton Hall, who's done life study on Edith. And... I'm like, no, no, Lord, I shut the book, you know, because in the back of my mind, I already knew where I was going. And I said to myself, I've come this far. I, I've gone through so much adversity, you know, converting, you know, from being a Jewish person to, to being a Christian. No, nobody really understood what I was at that point, you know, in terms of the people that had been in my life. And I knew that if I made that next step, that um, chances were that the people who were, were non-Catholic would also uh, reject me and not understand and I wasn't ready for that you know I wasn't ready to go you know, it was such a short period of time I mean you're talking only really two years in the non-denominational movement but I was teaching Bible study I was very involved in my church um, and so I asked a friend at work who was Catholic he was really the only person I knew that was Catholic and we had a, a church um, right close to uh, where I work at my police department St. Gregory's and I was so afraid, and I would sit in the parking lot um, on my lunch break, and I would cry, please, God, don't make me go in. Please, God, don't make me go in. Um, until one day, he, um, my friend Mauricio said, I'm going to go in with you. I'm going to take you in. Uh, um, and he took me in. And I didn't know at the time, but during that period of time, the Blessed Sacrament was there. And he, he, he took me in and said, you know, I want you to kneel here and just look. Just look. You know, and of course my heart is beating. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not a Catholic. Um, but there was such a pull and such an aura about that chapel and about that place and whatever I wasn't feeling spiritually in that um, in that chapel in the non-denominational church was everything I was feeling in that chapel. And I remember walking out and saying, "Please God, don't. Um, please God, don't." because I, I wasn't ready. But at the same token, I went back to two things, which was the promise I had made to God, that if he saved me, that I would, I would do whatever he asked of me for the rest of my life. And obviously my earlier years, which was whatever God's will was for my life, that I would follow. And so a couple of days later, no, my, my husband didn't know any of this at, the po at this point, except that I had visited. Um, I, again, on my lunch break, said, I'm, I'm going back in. 
and didn't know what the Blessed Sacrament was, didn't know what I was kneeling before. And I just, I came in and I silently prayed and I cried. Um, I don't think they were more verbal prayers than they were tears that were prayers, which we know are prayers. And, um, and I walked out and I just felt a peace that was beyond anything I had experienced, even on my initial acceptance of Christ. And I got in the car and I felt, somehow I felt different, still not knowing what the Blessed Sacrament was. Um, and as I was driving out, I heard God audibly say to me, Melissa, it's time to come home. <laughs> so that's when I... To home you didn't even know was a home. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I said, God, I don't even know a Catholic. Where are you sending me again, you know? Um, but I wasn't afraid. It was that same feeling of, you know, God saying to me, do not be afraid for I am with you. Um, do not be afraid. It just kept, it kept coming up. And I always thought to myself, you know, in becoming a Christian, now that I had this personal relationship with Jesus, um, the way my life was going, the blessings that God had bestowed on me, um, everything that he had healed in my life and changed in my life, I didn't care anymore what anybody thought of me. I, I was past that point. Um, even if I had to live alone, I, I didn't care. Um, I just wanted to do what God's will was. And so um, that started my journey into the Catholic faith. Now, our fulfillment of that, were you, ex were you maybe seeing some of that in the context of the Eucharist and all of that? Well, it a was. A connection with your past. It was um, Jews who convert. Um, we, say, we refer to ourselves as completed Jews. It's a full circle. Yeah. And it's funny because I had never been to a Mass. I had never been to a Catholic church. And again, the same friend said, well, I'm going to take you to Mass. I'm going to take it. Oh, no, 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 I'm good. You know, no, 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 you have to go to mass. Okay. So we happened to go to a parish, um, his parish where they, they serve the wine as well. And when I sat down, it was like sitting down at a Passover table, the four cups of wine and the tears again started to pour out. Had I not been in that parish, I don't know that I would have made the connection because some parishes don't, you know, don't have more than, than the one cup. And I just saw, God and I just saw Passover and I felt like I was back at temple and there was the bima and instead of a rabbi there was a priest but everything was full circle um, you know and I remember looking at the crucifix you know where it says in Latin you know Jesus Christ King of the Jews um, and I remember I met, remembered his promise to his people and I was his people um, and, and I looked up at him and I said this is this is where I'm supposed to be you know, this is where I'm supposed to be. And it was just amazing thinking to myself, the mass is the Passover table and making all, and, and my mind just going crazy with all of the connections. And um, that's when I started to really hunger for the Eucharist because I couldn't get in that line. And I was sitting there, you know, on that initial visit to, to that parish saying to myself, okay, how am I gonna do this? And going out to the priest and asking him about um, RCIA, and he said, oh, well, it's gonna take a year. So, but Father, I'm a Christian. Well, you know, there's other things that, that you may have to learn. And I remember saying to my friend Mauricio, well, I'm not ready for all of that yet, although God had different plans for me. <laughs> so.